So next up we've got Siobhan Wren, who's an ophthalmology consultant Imperial, so she's come a very long way um, <laughs> today. Um, and her talk is named I Spy With My Little Eye. Um, yes, I'm going to have a disclaimer that there's going to be some fairly scary pictures here, I'm afraid. Um, the principle of trauma is that really we shy away from eyes. I know that most people's eye training was usually spent down in the pub or, you know, it's the holiday on the rotation. So, and it's complicated, but it's a little caveat of complicated stuff. And I just want to sort of bring your attention to the stuff that you can actively do and make a difference to a pathway, particularly in children's lives. Before I just think about it, I must make a comment about the hydrocortisone on um, eyelids, but I'll talk about that possibly at the end, just because um, actually there's lots of eyelid ointment, which is probably more appropriate on that lid margin, particularly when you have sort of skin issues. But anyway, that was just another thought before I completely forget about it. Um, right, so it feels like quite a small thing, paediatric ocular trauma, but actually it's a third of all eye trauma, and eye trauma isn't that insignificant. It certainly isn't going away. It's getting more prevalent, if anything. Um, we certainly have got an increase in unfortunate acid attacks, school kids throwing acid at each other. Um, it's going up with the knife injuries in London. We certainly um, are getting more eye injuries, and it's possibly something to do with parents on smartphones. Um, you know, the papers that have come out in the last two years didn't really look at that, and I think we probably will do when we're looking at them in five years' time. It's not small. I mean, at least four million people in the world have bilateral blindness, and that's a very conservative issue. So what we have to think about is what little bit can we do to kind of stop that sort of absolute catastrophe of you can't stop the injury necessarily, although we could educate the population to get a bit better at it. You're obviously, unless you're eye trained, you're not particularly interested in what happens as soon as you say goodbye to that patient. But what are you going to do in between just to make a massive difference to that child? So um, paediatric ocular trauma is a typical boy, age seven, 50% um, at home. And that's, again, conservative because it's usually the parents minding the children. So they're usually very, they're very unlikely to be at school or in a sort of supervised area. It's usually the sort of parents. They're playing and often with a sharp implement. So what I'm trying to... Oh, can you... Oh, is it better? Sorry, I do apologise. Okay, right now, I'll really start to carry. Thank you. Can you hear? Is that better? Sorry. Um, so the first 60 minutes is what I want to focus your attention on, because is that is that good? Um, obviously, we're not going to necessarily change the injuries of anything they're going up at the moment, and we've just got to sort of think to ourselves, what are we going to do from that time? Not necessarily in the A and E department, which you may not all be in. Sometimes it's that physically at home when, you know, your child's fallen over onto a pencil or something of that order. So really, the priorities are trying to keep somebody sensibly comfortable and safe as a human being to another human being. And obviously, we do have tools to our hand to do that kind of carefully. Not making the situation worse is very important. And basic evaluation, again, we shy away from this because it's complicated. And trying to kind of get good pupil reactions, which are tricky, um, you know, I'm not even going to talk about looking at the optic disc today, so you can just put that aside. If, I'm not even going to mention the word ophthalmoscope, so just forget it. But just basically safely evaluating a child or an adult so that you can actually pass some information on 60 minutes later when the eye referral is either made, they come to you, the patient goes to them. So basically don't panic. Um, you're, going to see it, you're going to have seen it pretty much all in this very short talk except for you're not going to have seen it all because, you know, it happens. Somebody carrying a pencil and falling over a step. So the three parts of trauma I'm going to talk about are just category one, which is basically just keeping something comfortable, safe, and just doing basic checks, which is things like high femurs and blurts. Category two, stuff you already know, like the chemical washouts. And category th three, now these are the ones that I'll spend a little bit more time on because you need to make the difference in that first 60 minutes. And these things are like open globe and retrobulbar hemorrhage. So you may or may not be familiar with them yet, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you will be. So observations to keep it really simple. What can the patient see? Can they move their eyes? And is there any reaction there at all? If you can do that when you first meet a child, when they leave your care, that might have told somebody what the sort of that hour of critical first hour of care has happened. If you just don't do anything at all, 
then we'll never know. So what tools do you need, really? Well, here we are, a smartphone. Um, if you can hold a smartphone in front of a child at 30 centimetres, it doesn't have to be more complicated. Can you see that? Can you see which app you want to play at? I'm presuming this is the parents, because obviously you won't get your own smartphone back. Um, and basically, just can you see it with one eye and then the other eye? Now, if you can just say that, um, then if it goes down to light perception or no light perception in that next hour, there is an enormous amount of information, probably as much as anybody needs to say, particularly if they say, yeah, I want the Angry Birds one or something. So um, that, that's probably all you need. I always keep a toy with a light on it. Um, and I think that's probably the thing you should have in your pocket, just because by engaging their attention, you're actually getting a little bit of information back yourself. And th one of these on your key ring is very, very useful if you've lost your keys at night and trying to hang, you know, hang around and trying to get your key in the front door. So this, this is a far better useful tool of doing afferent pupillary defects and such, which are very, very hard. Um, in any casualty department, you should always, always have access to an anaesthetic drop and fluorescein. And the anaesthetic drop is the kindest one of all, because if you're ever going to try and evaluate somebody in pain, you need this drop. So I can pretty much tell most things I need to do from this child. Obviously, this child hasn't had trauma, but you can tell that they've got nice white eyes, they've got beautiful central reflexes, so they're looking at my little toy quite centrally and well. And if you just move it from right to left, you've pretty much got everything you need to know. Not hard, very sort of non-scary, just do it, basically. And if you haven't got a duck, then actually there's always one of those lurking around the wards. They're not quite as interesting to look at. So the basic checks, basically. Um, a high femur is an eye full of blood. <laughs> Essentially, what you want to do in that first 60 minutes is not allow a re-bleed. So when you're giving them painkillers, which is a nice human thing to do, don't give them things that can encourage bleeding. Make sure they just sit up and just make sure they're staying nice and calm and not moving around too much because a re-bleed can be, turn sort of this sort of injury into that sort of eight ball. So that's the only thing really you need to do. So just to recognize it, put it out there, high femur. A blowout fracture um, is when the maxillary bone has been fractured and the eye contents fall into the maxillary sinus. Um, it can be quite painful. There can, can be no signs at all. Orbital emphysema across the cheeks, the only way it could have got there is through a sinus into th the eyes. So always have a sort of low threshold for the mechanism of injury, particularly a sort of tennis ball into the face or eye. Um, so don't blow the nose because that can really swell up the orbital emphysema massively and certainly give them pain relief and antibiotics and steroids because it might be able to be fixed tonight if it doesn't blow up and swell too much, in which case it get, it, it's fixed in about two to four weeks later. So those are the things you really don't have to do very much about. So category two, this is stuff you already know about, but here's my pearls. Um, the alkali injuries are the ones you really, really worry about because alkalis keep going straight into the eye. The acids kind of coagulate at the surface. So as soon as you get that person in your room, the first thing you almost want to give them is a little bit of anaesthetic because everything will become a lot more relaxed as soon as you do that. You want to check the pH just to see which direction you're going in. And then 20 litres of balanced salt. There's been a lot of controversy about ringers or... Um, water. It doesn't really matter if, as long as it's clean and as long as you do it copiously. And if you don't manage to do anything else, just give them a little bit of topical anaesthetic. This is quite a useful thing if there's bilateral, con bilateral problems to just literally put one of those speculums on. And actually, again, if you have access to one of those things that keeps open, you'll all know that you wouldn't want to put your eyes open under the shower. So you just have to just make sure that you clean out the eyes, make sure there's no particulate matter and just keep flushing through. So every five or 10 minutes, top up with anesthesia. So here we go, the last few minutes on what you may make a difference about. And this is the scary part, because I'm going to teach you something about <laughs> cutting an eyelid open. <laughs> so an open globe injury, I mean, all you have to do really is this is a scary thing. And believe it or not, from you know, fairly nasty injuries, we've managed to kind of get really good vision back if they've been managed swiftly and well in the first hour. So always have a very low threshold for suspecting one. A teardrop pupil, just the mechanism of the injury, particularly if there was something sharp and it looks as if nothing's going on. Um, if you actually blot your own eye very gently, it sort of feels like a sort of slightly sort of perfect avocado or something like that. Um, 
I wouldn't obviously advise that you manipulate eyes very much, but there's only two circumstances where you'd ever need to do that. And one of them is one you're wondering that there could be a massive hemorrhage behind the eye, in which case it's rock hard. And the other time is when you're suspecting that it could be ruptured and you're not sure, in which case it feels like a fairly ripe tomato. And like when you're squeezing it in Waitrose, I wouldn't necessarily squeeze too hard, otherwise you're going to have to pay for it. So definitely, definitely don't squeeze... Definitely don't squeeze it too hard. So the fluorescing drop is in this circumstance again, where you're not sure you don't want to touch it because it looks quite messy. This will give you a little clue about whether it's actually leaking aqueous. So the management of it, I do apologize about the pictures. I could have avoided some of this gruesomeness. But again, raise the head up, make sure they don't lie down, make sure the pressure's kept nice and calm. Topical anesthesia if you want it. Don't put an eye patch on the eye find a paper cup, just put something that's sort of going to keep the eye away from the atmosphere, um, just find something just to protect it. The ophthalmology team may say put topical drops in, actually you could leave the topical drops well alone, but I would certainly give intravenous antibiotics, I would certainly give the tetanus if they haven't been up to date, and I would certainly give um, the painkillers um, and antiemetics. Now, I have an enormously low threshold for injuries. And so if a child sort of comes in and won't open their eye, I, they, they go to theatre that night. And, you know, this and pretty much my theory of if they're not opening their eye for some reason, there's usually a good reason for it. Right. Here's the last one. Last few minutes. So a retro orbital hemorrhage. You may not have even have heard of one of these yet, but like me watching Ray Mears in a sort of cave with a snake, hopefully I'll never need to kind of tackle a snake, but I kind of have a rough idea thanks to his guidance about it. Essentially, this is a true compartment syndrome. So basically, somebody's been whacked in the eye. Um, this is an older sort of child. I mean, I think he's actually about 16, where he was, kick he was doing kickboxing and got kicked in the eye. And he came into casualty and initially, sort of not too much, he was just coming in for an eye check. But the eye was getting worse, more uncomfortable, more painful. And if you've done your baseline quick check, even on an iPhone, um, you would have noticed that actually the next time you've done it, he can't really see very well. And you're sort of thinking, is it because he's in pain? What's going on with that? But essentially his vision's going down. When you sort of do your own little bolot of your own sort of nice avocado and then you touch that eye, you notice it's coming forward and you notice it's rock hard. Now, in the 60 minutes where somebody's going to come to you, you can make a call. You can just say to yourself, I'm going to leave somebody else to do this. Or you're going to start off trying to save his optic nerve, because this is the 60 minutes that counts. By the end of the 60 minutes, it's gone, and he's lost his vision for good. But you might be able to do something just to release it. So it's a canthotomy. Now, obviously, you may not be surgeons, and you may th think the whole thought of this is terrifying. But you make that call, because you certainly don't have to do it. It doesn't do any harm to try it. And even if you haven't done it properly, it heals really beautifully. But I'm going to just walk you through it in the last couple of minutes. It can save sight, and it's really fun to do if you've done it. And one of the coolest things I've ever seen is pitching up to a casualty department and somebody having done it. And I just thought that was the coolest thing I've possibly ever seen in my life. So the canthal tendon is what kind of holds our eye in place. And it's just underneath this corner part of our eye. Now, believe it or not, when we cut through that canthal tendon, it doesn't make a massive effect, and it actually heals beautifully on its own. So, you know, you don't even have to sew it up afterwards. Don't even have to think about it. So the first thing, ignore that picture, because you'd never inject towards the eye. Um, you'd obviously have to consent. Now, this is children we're talking about. So if we are even thinking about doing this, even thinking like ophthalmology's on their way, look, I think I have a very strong suspicion, hard eye, vision's going down. I'm going to think about a canthotomy. I can't remember the name but I know I have to cut to the side of the eye. Are you happy? Yep, let's go for it, because I'm not going to get there for half an hour. They're finishing off their pint in the pub. So the first thing you're doing is consent them, chat to the parents, give them some sedation. My favorite is ketamine, very, uh, very cool, you know, because I give a lot for my Botox treatments for kids. So basically consent them, give them some sedation, inject some anesthesia with lignocaine and adrenaline. I always use adrenaline for around the eyes, because they bleed like hell, and always inject away from the eye. Just keep it safe. Okay, so that's number one. Number two and three together. Once the anesthetic is kicked in, so in other words, you've had a bit of two, two or three minutes clean around the eye, do what you want to. Squash the eye flat, so you're going to get a nice sort of clean line. There's not much space behind here, but if you just slip something in, crush it, and then cut it, um, you're not going to go wrong. You could actually even stop there. That might be enough. But really, to get the maximum effect of it, 
we go straight to number four, which is pull the eyelid out, and then you'll find the silky tendon just there. You have to sometimes clean it a little bit, and you snip down and cut it. And as soon as you do that, you'll see the pupil start to react again. Somebody will say, oh my God, I'm starting to see color vision again. It's all starting to come back. And if it's not enough, if it really isn't enough, you can do the cancel tendon, um, which is on the upper part as well. So you can do both of them, okay? Now, I'm really hoping you never need to do it, but you know, if you do need to do it, then that would be definitely the coolest thing. And in those 60 minutes, you would have saved somebody's eyesight. And although they may not remember your name, they'll certainly remember that sort of lucky night in casualty they met somebody who had the balls to do it. So that's just on the skin again. So basically, the bottom line with it all is refer everything to ophthalmology. That's dead easy, isn't it? But um, just be human, keep people comfortable, keep them safe, do things you need to do. And you know what? Have the balls to do it if you can. <laughs>